Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Tanya Vinton here with Dallas OBC Society. Um, I'm here today with Dr. Jamie Almondez to have a discussion on terzepatide. So um, Dr. Almondez um, is a founding board member for Dallas OBC Society. He is a board trustee. Um, he is currently the medical director for the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center's Weight Wellness Program and an associate professor of internal medicine. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and also board certified in endocrinology and internal medicine. He received his medical degree from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and internal medicine training at the um, uh, I don't even know how to say this, Mater Miss Kodori um, University Hospital in Dublin. Dr. Almondez completed in, 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 internal medicine residency and in endocrinology fellowship training at the Mayo Clinic and a fellowship um, in nutrition and metabolic diseases at UT Southwestern. Dr. Almondez's clinical and research interests include interdisciplinary programs for weight management, um, as well as post-bariatric weight recurrence and disparities in obesity treatment. Thanks so much for joining us. I know uh, this is a busy day for you with clinic and all that, um, but we're really excited to have you give us this um, update on terzepidide, which recently became available as a new FDA-approved treatment for type 2 diabetes. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about this medication and really why it's so exciting for the field of obesity medicine? Absolutely. So thanks again for the uh, for the kind invitation and introduction uh, today. Uh, so it's my pleasure to give you guys an update on terzepatide. And so to give a broad uh, kind of overview of terzepatide, what this is, it's a novel dual GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist, which was approved by the FDA for treating people with type 2 diabetes uh, in the middle of May of this year. So relatively recent approval for type 2 diabetes. There are some additional benefits, we believe, of the combination of GLP-1 and GIP receptor agonism. If you think of current medications which are approved for obesity treatment, which are incretin-based therapies, we're thinking of liraglutide and semaglutide, which are a GLP-1 receptor agonists. So this is a combination of GLP and GIP. And we believe that there's some additive benefits. Uh, if we kind of look at the CNS, there may be uh, additional impact on energy expenditure. Um, with the addition of the GIP receptor agonist. Um, there's also kind of direct impacts on cardiovascular wise from plasma uh, lipids, inflammation, endothelial function. Um, the GI tract, as with GLP-1 receptor agonists here, there may be uh, a GIP component to this, and then also their GIP receptor activity within adipose tissue and indirect impacts in skeletal muscle and function. It's important to highlight that this medication is currently approved for treating type 2 diabetes and has not yet been approved for obesity treatment. We'll touch on that a little bit more. And within the pancreatic islets, they really promote um, the secretion uh, of insulin uh, in order to help to manage blood sugars when they are elevated. So these are data that are from the SURPASS-1 trial, which was a phase three clinical trial, looking at terzepatide at three doses, 5, 10, and 15 milligrams once a week compared with placebo in people with type 2 diabetes who had a mean uh, starting body weight of about 85 kilograms. And we can see the weight reduction here as we kind of go through the titration. So terzepatide is started at 2.5 milligrams once weekly for four weeks, and then there's an increase by 2.5 milligrams uh, every week, uh, sorry, excuse me, every four weeks uh, until you achieve their target treatment dose, which can be either 5, 10, or 15 milligrams. And you can see that there's a dose-dependent reduction in body weight. What these arrows point out at the bottom is at what point the patients reached that therapeutic dose of the arm that they're in. So it took four weeks for them to reach the five milligram dose, 12 weeks for the 10, and 20 weeks for the 15 milligram. So it's important to know that there is quite a gradual dose titration, several orders of magnitude for them to go from a 2.5 milligram starting dose all the way to a 15 milligram maintenance dose if that's where you want them to be for treating their diabetes. On average, there was about an 11% weight reduction for the people in the, on the 15 milligram dose. And these are people with type two diabetes. And what we know from studies, including lifestyle, pharmacotherapy and surgery is that people with type two diabetes, the weight loss tends to be attenuated compared to those without diabetes for a variety of different reasons. 
Um, if we look in this study at the proportion of participants who achieve more than 10% weight loss, close to 50%, which is impressive. And there are also wonderful decreases in hemoglobin A1C, so a two-point reduction in A1C, improvements in waist circumference, blood pressure, uh, and lipids, uh, which are all very interesting. We're awaiting the results of the cardiovascular outcomes trial uh, surpass uh, for diabetes, which will hopefully be available sometime uh, within the next couple of years. So we don't yet have cardiovascular outcomes data for terzepatide, and we're looking forward to seeing what these kind of improvements in body weight and uh, glycemia uh, impart upon people with type 2 diabetes. The question is, you know, is terzepatide more impactful than kind of what was one of the leaders uh, in the um, or really kind of almost unopposed uh, leaders in the Incretin world, which was semaglutide prior to this. So semaglutide is a proof for treating uh, both obesity and type 2 diabetes. And there aren't any head-to-head -head trials yet, but what I'm trying to do here is present two different studies. So the SURPASS-2 study, which was the use of terzepatide in people with type 2 diabetes compared with semaglutide 1 milligram, which is the gray bar here, and then also on the right panel here, we've got step two, which is semaglutide at the one milligram and 2.4 milligram dose. In the surpass two trial for people with type two diabetes and those on the 15 milligram dose, the average weight loss was about 13.2% or 13.1%. And the step two, the average weight loss was about 9.6% for people uh, with type two diabetes on the 2.4 milligram dose. You can see at the clinical cut points of 5, 10, and 15% weight reduction, you can see that there's a dose-dependent decrease uh, in body weight, where at the, at the 15 milligram dose, 40% uh, lost 15% of their body weight or more, compared with semaglutide 2.4, we're looking at about 28% here. So this is not a statistically or scientifically sound way to compare people. These are two different uh, clinical trials, but it's just to give people an idea of the effectiveness of this medication for helping people to achieve clinically meaningful weight loss and a rough guide comparison to whether it is as effective or more effective perhaps than other incretin based therapies on the market. Now, remember, these are for people with type 2 diabetes. When we look at the data for people without type 2 diabetes, this is a surmount trial that was um, uh, presented at the American Diabetes Association meeting in June. And so this is for people with obesity um, who are treated with terzepatide 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, and 15 milligrams um, for weight reduction. And we can see that their body weight uh, reduction, 5 milligram dose, average weight loss of uh, 16% versus 21 versus 20 two percent for the 15 milligram dose and so this was at 72 weeks it's important to kind of point that out that although it takes 20 weeks to get to the 15 milligram dose you can see that patients continue to lose weight through the one year and beyond mark um, down to the 22.5 percent market at uh, 72 weeks here and if we look at the proportion of people achieving uh, more than five percent uh, weight loss but over 90 percent and more than 20 percent in over 56% of participants, this is actually quite impressive. You know, there's always going to be side effects with medications. We know this. And for incretin therapies, um, these are mostly GI related. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation were kind of the primary G GI side effects for you to be aware of with these medications. Um, the average cost currently or list price without insurance coverage is about $900 for patients. Um, We've been getting this covered for people with diabetes relatively easily. There are currently promotions uh, for people with commercial or private insurance um, to have discounts with that. So making sure that you talk with your um, pharmaceutical representative uh, from the company to find out what is available for you in your area and whether or not you're able to get samples would be a good way forward with this. To kind of give you a rough idea or reminder about kind of the context of terzepatide within kind of what we have for anti-obesity medications, we have Orlistat, the lipase inhibitor, uh, Gelasis 100, which is a cellular citric acid hydrogel, which is technically a medical device, not a medication, which expands uh, in the stomach to induce satiety and fullness. Uh, there's fentramine, the sympathomimetic agent, 
also a given in combination with topiramate, which works on GABA and is also a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. There's a combination of bupropion and naltrexone, which works very well for our patients with regards to cravings. And then also the GLP-1 therapies that are currently approved for treating obesity, liragotide and semaglutide. And just to highlight again, that terzepatitis is not currently approved for treating obesity. Um, in terms of off-label medications, there are lots of them. I'm sure you're all familiar with using medications which aren't technically anti-obesity medications, but are very helpful for weight loss. And these can include metformin, non-liraglutide, semaglutide, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors to pyramid bupropion, other stimulants as well, and now potentially off-label use of terzepatide if you think appropriate. Pipeline medications include this GLP-1, GIP, GLP-1, and glucagon and other receptor agonists, oral uh, GLP-1 agents, GLP-1 and amylin, amylin receptor analogs, PYY, GDF-15, and a whole host of other things which are in the wings uh, that will hopefully be helpful for treating obesity as we move forward. As we kind of look at the gap that this is filling, if we look at kind of traditional lifestyle modification, which is this green bar here where people will lose uh, in a non-sustained way somewhere between three and 7% of their body weight versus bariatric surgery, which is about 20 to 35% body weight reduction, Prior to the advent of incretin therapies, we were looking at somewhere between 5 to 10% weight reduction. With liragotide on average, it was about 9%. And then with semaglutide, that really kind of brought incretin kind of therapies for obesity to the fore, with close to 15% weight reduction on average uh, in the step one trial. When we now add in combination therapies or dual agonisms such as terzepatide, uh, which is a GLP GIP agonist that we've been speaking about today, and then something which is also being developed. Uh, which is a combination of semaglutide with cagrolintide, which is uh, an amylin analog, um, we're hoping to see weight reduction at over 20%, hopefully towards 25%, once these are integrated into uh, lifestyle and other management programs for weight reduction. So to bring this all home, terzepatide is a weekly uh, injectable dual GL, GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist that is currently only FDA approved for treating type 2 uh, diabetes, there are uh, impressive weight reduction results uh, for people with and without diabetes. On average, people lost about 22% of their body weight uh, when without diabetes in the surmount one trial, um, but it is not yet approved. Consider treating people with obesity and type 2 diabetes with incretin based therapies. And so these could, for obesity treatment, include liragotide, semaglutide, and terzapatide or other agents, including dilaglutide, that can help people to achieve better uh, glycemia, better body weight, and also optimize their cardiovascular risk. Uh, terzepatide use uh, for obesity in people without diabetes right now is currently off-label, and be cautious with regards to um, gastrointestinal side effects when prescribing incretin therapies, because those seem to be the main challenges that our patients experience. So um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, what questions do you have for me, Dr. Vinton? Thank you so much for that very thorough discussion of terzepatide. I hope uh, that provided folks um, with some good insight into this new medication. Um, since it's been out, um, what are your clinical experiences with it? What kind of clinical pearls do you have to share with us? So we, we've been prescribing it for patients for about a month now, and we're seeing um, good results um, with respect to glycemia. I think it's probably too early to look at kind of weight loss outcomes, uh, given that we've only been prescribing it for a month. And we've talked about kind of the gradual dose titration that it takes 20 weeks to get uh, to the 15 milligram dose. Uh, and people continue to lose weight uh, through a year. So I think it, it's too early to kind of say how we're doing from a weight loss perspective, but anecdotally for people um, with type 2 diabetes who may also be on basal insulin others, we're seeing dramatic improvements uh, in, their, uh, in their glycemia and also with regards to kind of how they're feeling from an appetite perspective. We have had a few patients who've had quite marked nausea with the medications. And so making sure that we coach people on the mechanism of action of these medications and ensure that they know to be aware of kind of their environment, surroundings, how quickly they're eating, the portion sizes, et cetera, to minimize really any uh, potential negative impact that this could have uh, on their overall uh, well-being from a gastrointestinal perspective. Um, when it comes to kind of transitioning people from an existing GLP-1 receptor agonist over to that, there's, we don't really have any clinical data on what the appropriate dose is uh, to transition one versus the other. 
um, what we have been doing uh, in the office and appears to be working reasonably well if someone is already on a GLP-1 receptor agonist that maximal dose and tolerating it well, started them on the five milligram dose of terzepatide instead of 2.5 or doing an abbreviated titration of two weeks of the 2.5 milligram weekly dose uh, and then escalating to five milligrams after that appears to be going well. And we'll hopefully have some more information and data on that as kind of the months go on and we have a better or wider clinical experience with it. Do you have any um, suggestions as far as how to work around the nausea for patients and other GI side effects? So there, I think the, the primary thing is to try to prevent it in terms of kind of how people are interacting uh, with their food environment. Um, I think making sure that people, again, kind of understand how the medications work, potential impact on their GI side effects, and also to note that um, that the nausea typically passes after a while and not to feed the nausea. I think so many of us have been programmed by our parents uh, that if we feel nauseated to have some crackers or drink uh, some kind of a soda or something like that to do that, that's really kind of adding uh, adding gas to the fire. If we try uh, to, to treat our nausea from incretin-based therapies with more food, I think it just leads to misadventure. Um, judicious use of anti-nausea medications uh, can be very helpful, especially if patients are high-risk for dehydration or other issues, um, including if they have uh, challenges with renal function or the things you want to be careful not to get people into kind of a pre-renal dehydration picture because of either low oral intake or vomiting. There has um, been some concern about, uh, you know, potential contraindications. Can you talk about that um, uh, for a second, like say with the pancreatitis, um, thyroid cancer, et cetera, et cetera? So so with regards to pancreatitis, the, the, there were a few cases of pancreatitis uh, in uh, the surmount trial um, for people with uh, obesity. That being said, that when people lose weight, they are high risk for developing uh, gallstones and other issues that may precipitate pancreatitis as well. We do know that people with GLP-1 may be, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists may be at increased risk for pancreatitis in the, in the absence of gallstones. So making sure that you uh, use your best clinical judgment when you're assessing someone's risk uh, for uh, pancreatitis when you kind of talk through them and deciding whether or not it's appropriate to try somebody who may have had either remote gallstone pancreatitis who subsequently underwent cholecystectomy versus someone who has recurrent idiopathic pancreatitis. That might be someone to maybe consider not using a medication like this and just in case they uh, develop pancreatitis and it's then attributed to the medication wrongly. I understand that there are some concerns about um, oral contraceptive effectiveness um, with terzepatide and the dose adjustments. Have you um, guys been working on that with patients? How do you counsel them? How do you document this? So for our patients who are on any anti-obesity medication or eating in a way to affect uh, significant amounts of weight loss, that's not typically compatible with healthy pregnancy and child development. And so making sure that people who are on a weight loss journey who are taking pharmacotherapy and eating in a way that's going to cause rapid changes in their body weight are aware that this is not compatible uh, with having healthy pregnancy and to be proactive uh, and making sure that we can uh, prevent any unwanted or unplanned pregnancies as much as possible, or working with them on, well, what is it that's safe and appropriate to do given where they're at in their fertility journeys. With regards to kind of decreased efficacy, we don't have kind of concrete data on that. Um, with regards to recommendations, you know, make, making sure that people are using reliable hormonal contraception if possible and appropriate for their health situation or other barrier methods as consistently as possible um, is the most important thing to do. Well, great. Um, I think that rounds us out for this discussion today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Again, thank you, Dr. Amandas, for your time um, to talk to us about so this really exciting um, therapy for type two diabetes and hopefully soon enough uh, also be FDA approved for obesity medicine. With that, hope everybody has a nice day um, and stay cool out there for you guys in DFW. It's another triple digit day. Great, thanks so much.